Uh, hi and welcome back, Sujata. Uh, a lot of people are going to be very happy seeing you back. Uh, you have been a partner, a friend, uh, a handholder of sorts when we started this podcasting journey and the Values Workshop has been moving. I, I do not know if you've been looking at some episodes every now and then. I hope you approve of what we've been doing. <laughs> so, welcome. <laughs> to this uh, episode. Um, I wanted specifically to speak to you today because uh, I've seen you uh, change your roles with time and uh, off late, I'm quite keen to know uh, how you're doing and how you're approaching life as a therapist. So can you tell me a little bit about your journey? How did the shift from um, HR happen to uh, counseling, mm -hmm. if you could tell us a little about that. Sure, no. Yeah, it's. I'd probably go back to say thank you for having me again. I was quite thrilled when I saw your message. I said, yes, this is exactly what I wanted. It's been a long time. Yeah. And I was reflecting on the first time when we started this all. Was it back in COVID? Yeah, a little around that time. Yes. Yeah. So well done to you and the team. You guys have come a long way. Yeah. Okay, so to answer that question, um, so I've, I qualified as a therapist last year. So I was in training for almost five years. Oh. And being in the UK, it's also something, it's not the most regulated, but they try to keep it regulated. So I have an ethical practice. I have to be part of some governing bodies and legislations and all that. Uh, I still continue to straddle both the worlds, Bunty. So the bills still get paid by the HR job. Oh, and, okay. Uh, yeah. And the counseling practice is something uh, I'm building very slowly and very mindfully, if I may say that. Because uh, I think after five years of training, um, I, I probably connected or... Yeah, rediscovered aspects to myself that I oh. thought had gone long back. Uh, most importantly, the bad ones, I would say, because the good ones are always easily accessible, uh -huh. aren't they? Uh. Yeah, so uh, I think to answer your question, just being a therapist in the room is also being aware of who you are with your own biases, your own values, and your own beliefs. And um, how you are able to make an impact with clients without getting your person into the sessions, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's a challenge. It is a challenge and it does happen quite frequently. And I think I'm told the sign of a good therapist is recognizing those challenges, what we call in therapy, therapy language as counter-transference and transference. So basically what that means is if the client is telling me something and I am, um, I'm kind of affected or there is a nerve that the client has touched with their presenting issue, of which I may have lived experience, how do I still continue to you know, maintain the focus and not, not allow my lived experience of that presenting issue come into the sessions, if that makes sense? Yeah, I uh, I find it a tough job uh, most of the times when I look at it. Some part of me does not believe that it helps except for the basic understanding that a human being, human being brings to a conversation, which is being a good listener. Uh, I guess we are not good listeners and that is why uh, you guys are in business. That is primarily one of the things that I keep thinking and it does not reflect very nicely on us as a society is what I would want to think. Not in terms of the patients themselves, patients or clients as you call them. Right. Mm. But my question, uh, I want to go to a basic thing. Uh, why are your uh, clients not called patients? Is that the technicality or what? Um, see, as much as uh, there is an element to doing clinical stuff in my work, my qualification and my training doesn't allow me to prescribe any medication. 
Um, mm -hmm. And where I am based here in the UK, the terminology is more clients than patients. So I'm not really mm -hmm. looking at clinical stuff all the time. I mean, there is an element of clinical interventions. I have clinical audits and clinical supervision and all that. Uh, but the reason we don't necessarily call them patients is that's that's more of a clinical reference, if that makes sense. Okay. So uh, does it happen that if you are, say, I come to you with some problem and I've been speaking to you for a while and you realize that I need clinical intervention, so how, how would that work? Would you uh, prescribe me uh, somebody else, uh, visiting somebody else or what? So that's a that's an interesting question. So, uh, so I've just recently, uh, so we have different levels of qualification. So I qualified as a level four uh, counselor therapist last year. And uh, what that means is I can work with what we typically call in the US, UK, a service level A and a service level B presenting issue. So it could be mm -hmm. things like, you know, everyday stuff, friendships, relationships, divorce, feeling a bit anxious. Those things are considered in the first two categories. A service level C is where there is an underlying issue of mental health, uh, mental health issues like, say, schizophrenia, bipolar, eating disorders, personality disorders, all those kind of things. Those are categorized in a service level C. So where I am currently with my qualification, I can work with clients who are in a service level C, um, keeping in mind that, that this person perhaps has an underlying health condition, mental health, severe mental health condition. They are also on medication. Um, and they're also being supported by a larger team. So... Again, if I have a patient who's diagnosed with, say, bipolar type type A or type 1, like they call, uh, they would, depending on when they were diagnosed and how long they are living with that condition, they would usually work with the local health, health service providers. There will usually be a team that works with them. So there will definitely be a, a psychiatrist who is involved as well. There will be a team of doctors, nurses, carers. In some cases, there would be people like nutritionists as well. So what happens is if I'm working with somebody like that, I become part of a multidisciplinary team. So I'm one of the many people that is supporting the client. Uh, I cannot prescribe like in any counseling, whether it is somebody with a with a mental health, underlying mental health, severe mental health issue, or somebody who's come to present, say, issues around not being able to get a promotion or just having recently broken off with a partner, I don't really prescribe anything. My job, Bunty, the way I see it is to facilitate my clients in arriving at their own solutions. Mm -hmm. To your earlier point of we not being good listeners. I try to be a good listener without trying to form any judgment. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes clients do need validation, don't they? It's, it's just a it's, a, it's a very basic human thing. Yeah. And, and I'm trained as an integrative counselor, which means I have been trained in different modalities like psychodynamic and CBT and what have you. Depending on the client's presenting issues, I would dip into some of these modalities or theories. Um, so personally, I'm a big fan of psychodynamic, which is where Sigmund Freud comes into picture. So... His theory believes, he believed that our early life experiences, a past history, a childhood, a growing up years, they have a huge impact on who we are as people and how we are in our intimate and non-intimate relationships as well. So when I work with a client, I, I always tend to find out some of these things to really figure out what their personal history has been and how that continues to 
you know, have an effect on all the decisions that they make, or at least most of the decisions that one makes. Okay, Does one of the things, why, yeah, while you were talking about this, um, okay, my question is very pointed. You are a trained professional. Uh, I'll go back to the point of listening. I'm just digging deeper there. Uh, very often I find and I kind of do the same thing is what I've been told uh, and I do it well is what I've been told also but I am unsure about what it means except that I try and be a patient listener uh, not always successful but most mm -hmm. times I try and listen to people and trying to understand where they are coming from uh, <clears throat> I don't have any background of uh, mm -hmm. technical knowledge required for the same. Like, even some mm -hmm. of the terms that you use, I cannot actually claim to understand them. Or even mm -hmm. if I understand them, it's basic English phrase that I understand, but not really mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. dynamics of uh, mm -hmm. each of those elements. Mm -hmm. How do you, as a human being, or how do you as a professional separate the two in your head when somebody is talking to you? Uh, and how do you, the further question to that is how do you stop yourself from becoming too mechanical about it? Or is it necessary to be mechanical? I'll answer the last question first. Yeah, I think in the beginning of today's chat, I said I try to do it mindfully. This is where the mindfulness comes. I don't take on too many clients. So I have a very structured process before I accept clients. I always offer an initial 20 minute free consultation uh, for me to understand their presenting issues and for them to figure out if I'm the right therapist for them. Okay. Yeah. So then I just leave it at that. So we talk for 20, 30 minutes, clients, they present whatever they want to. I have a ready list of questions that I ask them for me to understand, you know, things like personal history, presenting issues, stuff like if there's any medication involved, self-harm, <coughs> is there any dependency on drugs and alcohol and all those kind of things. So in that 20, 30 minutes, Bunty, I'm kind of building a, a an picture. outline of mental picture of a map of my client, really. Um, and then, of course, we discuss the, the counseling fees and the frequency of sessions. So for people, it's the first time. It's really an opportunity for them to even understand how this works, because many a times clients do think that I have the answer for everything. Uh, so the answer is no, I don't have the answer. And even if I do have the answer, I don't really tell you what it is. Right. So that's where because. I take on clients in a considered way and also reflecting on my competencies. So I think there's a reason why we train for this long because one of the things you are urged to do is recognize and reflect on your own areas of incompetency, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are areas that I know I will struggle to work with perhaps for personal reasons or because I would feel out of depth. Say, for example... Uh, uh, there's a past history of addiction in my family, extended family with gambling and alcohol. So I've seen the kind of damage it has done to some of my family members. I will struggle to work with the client who presents addictions because it will take me to my early experience as to how disruptive it has been on families that I'm aware of. Yeah, that makes so, sense. So in the initial consultation, if a client says that I'm, I'm addicted to, I don't know, gambling or alcohol or substance misuse or whatever that is, I think increasingly screen time is becoming a big addiction as well. Um, if I feel there is an issue like that, I have to respectfully um, decline to work because I feel I will not be at the right or the effective therapist for them. That's wonderful. It's wonderful yeah. because it's one of the rare times that I'm seeing a human side to this. 
whatever one has heard or whatever one presumes is so mechanical oh, otherwise. Oh no, absolutely. Again on the on the <coughs> mechanical side, right? When we were training, some of these things didn't make sense. So there is something called onward reference. I'm like, I used to think, Abhi client agaya hai to why do I need to do an onward referral, right? But having had nearly 300 hours of practice, client hours in the last one year in my private practice, I, I've had instances where um, I, had a, I had a young client about 19 years old. So he just first year of university away from home, um, got addicted to alcohol um, and pornography as well. Um, after two sessions, I realized I will not be able to work with this, with this client. So I was out there letting him know that as much as I'd like to help him, I will not be the right therapist. And I made an onward referral to somebody else from my network. And he, he's very happy with that therapist. So I try not to do things mechanically. I never operate with a, with a full book appointment, if that makes sense. So that's the reason I said the HR job still pays the bills. Uh, but the counseling yeah. work is my long-term work. I don't accept more than eight or 10 clients in a week. I it's it's coming up to a year, Bunty, in November since I since I started my independent practice. And I've had clients who come weekly for the last one year. And mm -hmm. I have clients who come in bi-weekly or they dip in and dip out. So reflecting back uh, on this on this chat, I'm thinking it does feel nice that you know it's been a year and i've had clients who finished 25 to 30 sessions over a period of 10 11 months and they still keep coming so so there must be something they must be get they must be having some outcomes yeah. coming into sessions how do you uh, there are two questions running in my mind i'll ask you the first one how do you ensure that this does not become a personal relationship in terms of even basic human touch because sometimes it is required that you are able to hold that objectivity into the situation uh, which does start with you not being uh, you being very careful and mindful about who you pick up but finally we are human beings and these are areas of uh, vulnerability that we are talking about. How do you ensure that uh, you hold your head and uh, do not give away to the whim of the time or uh, situation in case it gets very overwhelming? So I do recognize I do recognize I've had these situations uh, and I always always maintain a very strict boundary. I never follow up with a client unless if I know they have discussed something really difficult and it's been an emotional session. I'll make sure to check that they are okay. Maybe the next day or two, I'll just send a text message to find if they are all right. And if they say they are, then that's pretty much it. I don't follow up after that. Um, sometimes in, in sessions, clients do present things that can be overwhelming and that can be sometimes a part of my lived experience as well. Um, I've had situations where, where I have, I won't say cried with my clients, but I've had tears filling up. And I very openly acknowledge that and I say that, you know, what you just said is very moving. Or I acknowledge it by saying, I know what that means. Yeah. It's really, really being empathetic at that moment to what, what is being said. It's, it's quite a fine balance to not make it about you, but to make yeah. it about the client. Um, and I think I, how do I think? I believe I operate from a fairly self-aware place. So if I do see these things coming up, I address it with supervision. So, so I'm here in the UK, one of the biggest bodies is the British Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy. 
So I'm a paid member of the BACP. Uh, they have a directory listings and that's where I get some of my clients from. So to be a part of this profession, one of the things that is a must is regular clinical supervision. So if I feel, say you are a client and you're presenting issues that I'm not able to work with or I feel stuck, I present that in supervision. Obviously, client, can, uh, client anonymity is maintained. I have individual and group supervision as well. So I have close to four hours of clinical supervision in a month where mm -hmm. I present issues about clients that I find difficult or may I am experiencing counter-transference or some of the issues are overwhelming. How do I work with that? So, mm -hmm. uh, so in individual supervision, it's a one-on-one -on -one, 60 minute. I do it once every two weeks. And then okay. in group supervision, there are other people like me um, and they present their cases and we we tend to ask them questions. How would you do it? <coughs> Say, for example, I'm just in the last stages of finishing my couples counseling, course on couples counseling. And somebody the other day in a group supervision presented an issue about uh, uh, infidelity in, in the couple's marriage. And she, the, the counselor said, it doesn't feel right that one of the partner is lying. And then somebody asked her, what is your relationship with truth? What does being truthful mean to you? Yeah. So we are exploring things around our own beliefs and biases. And I think at the, at the top of it all, your cultural background makes a big impact. It is present all the time. Okay, by your, you mean you or the clients? Yeah, uh, me as well, the client as well. So if I'm working with somebody who's Caucasian, this part of the world, born and brought up in the UK, I I will work with an awareness that his life experience and mine are very different. He grew up in a different part of the world to me. The social conditioning has been different because mm -hmm. that also has a huge impact on how you live your life and what decisions you make in relationships as well. Right. Uh, the second question that was running in my head was, uh, what is the core competency mm -hmm. that somebody needs to become a quote unquote good therapist? I do not know what is a good therapist, but uh, it's one of the first times I'm talking to someone who's giving us an insider's view of what really happens. And uh, thank you for being quite blunt about how you're approaching it and uh, mm. including all the vulnerable parts of it. So my question to you is, if you have you thought about this as a question earlier or uh, would you be willing to think of it now? What is the one thing that a person ought to have if one wants to help other people who are having mental issues of any kind. Are you talking about qualifications that you can pay and train or are you talking about human qualities? Human qualities. Qualifications oh, empathy. will obviously follow. But yeah, I person, would say... What is it? Oh, empathy and kindness, Bunty. Yeah, well, I can start crying talking about it. I think kindness... As, uh, as a gesture is, is highly underrated. It, it is probably the most generous thing that you can give in a relationship or to a friendship. Kindness. Wow. Yeah, yeah. But love, when I was training, I, I, <clears throat> I, did, I did very... Uh, um, I started with the basics, to be honest. I mean, I am somebody who is in my late 40s. I've had plenty of life-changing experiences. And on the back of one of them, almost eight years back, I received counseling for bereavement. Um, and that is what kind of gave me an insight as to how this whole thing works. And I decided to train as a counselor and here we are. So I started counseling uh, back in 2018. I started with a basic listening course for eight weeks. 
and you must oh. think what happens yeah i started with a basic listening course and from there i went on and i was lucky to have a tutor who felt the uh, uh, I had it in me because the two-year diploma is a long commitment in terms of time, money, and effort. And I remember her telling me that uh, I can teach you theories, but I can't teach you how to be kind. You seem to have it naturally, so why not pursue this, she said. <clears throat> so that kind of did it for me. So mm -hmm. just the warmth and the kindness, it doesn't matter what color or what race or ethnicity. I, I am lucky to work with the with a diverse set of clients. I yeah. have a fair bit of clients uh, who, who are from India, from Sri Lanka. I have a couple of clients from Pakistan, one from Afghanistan. And I work with clients from uh, from Nigeria as well. Uh, so yeah, there's quite a diverse mix of clients that I work with. Okay, this is very interesting that you brought this up. Uh, not that I was thinking of this as a question. So what is the one thing if you have to underline, these are all as diverse as backgrounds can be. Uh, some of them, obviously Asian, there is this one color for all kind of thing. But still, uh, I guess if one were to uh, go into specifics, one would realize there is a lot of differences in the way we approach life. Mm -hmm. What is the commonality according to you? Commonality in sense. Every client comes with a different set of problems. They come yes. from a different background. Yeah. But is there any commonality that you see to their condition that you realize that? Uh, I think the common common thing there is keeping aside the presenting issue. It's the human need to connect and to talk and to feel heard and understood, perhaps validated even. Because, I mean, one of the theories what I apply is also called person-centric, which is Carl Rogers. He believes that we all have our capacity to find our own answers, given if we have the right core conditions, which is, you know, your growing up years, your parental affection, your social security, financial, education, all those things. So when a client comes to my to me for sessions, I start at a place where I tell myself, my client already knows the answers. I'm only helping him or her figure out what they look like. Yeah. Rather than telling myself, oh, I'm the therapist. I know how to help you. you know, I, it's, it's like telling a mother, right? Okay, a newborn is newborn, but then you think a mother has to know everything. I feel no. If a, if a child is three months old, so is the mom who's three months old. And that's the level I intend to work. I try to work with my clients as well. How do you stop yourself from being arrogant and proud that you solved something which was otherwise a difficult uh, solution perhaps? You know, that's a very interesting question. I don't consider myself that I'm solving something. The, the proof of the pudding is, this may sound very odd, when the clients come and tell me that I think I don't need any sessions and I agree with them. Oh, wow. Yeah. So yeah, is that, so that answer? Yes. Yeah, and so I agree beautiful. with them. Yeah. Oh, I can't tell you, Bunty, it is such a beautiful thing when clients come and tell you. And you also know it. Say, I, I was working with this young lady for about, uh, we started back in March and we finished the second week of August. So about four, five months. Uh Coming up to the last couple of sessions, I could see that things were changing for her. Um, all the presenting issues were kind of falling in place. Uh, so the last session when she came, she said, uh, is it okay if I take a break? I said, you know what? I said, you actually read my mind. I said, I don't think you need, se need sessions anymore. We don't need to meet weekly, I said. If you do need to come back, you know where I am, I said. So don't pressurize yourself to you know, start maybe slowing down or coming alternate week. None of those things. If you feel you had the outcome, I think for me, that is a sign of success. If you want to call it a success. Yeah. It's quite beautiful. Uh, yeah. yeah. Earlier, 
much earlier when we had started the podcast, we had done an episode on this kindness or weakness. Mm. Uh, in fact, uh, the funny part is whoever I have to say that we've done, we tackled different topics because uh, till we were doing this together, I was doing different topics every week, mm. considering that both of us were the same at that point of time. We still are, yeah. Bhante. That's that's the one that yeah stays in my head. Uh, how do you uh, communicate the wisdom? Do you communicate the wisdom at all uh, in your with your clients if you have something, or else uh, you just got to be patient for them to get to the point where they realize it themselves. See, again, that's a very tricky balance, right? Depending on how the relationship is progressing. So I, I, my, the general, the general ideas clients should have about six to eight sessions because it's a process of building trust as well, yeah. right? People who struggle with trusting or have trust issues are not going to just open the floodgates but then there are clients who can't stop talking straight up for the the minute okay. from the word go, yeah. right? So each client is different. And uh, so typically, if I feel we are not having any outcomes, so, so if you are agreeing, okay, let me go back. Sorry for confusing. So if, if a client agrees that they want to have six sessions to start with, at the end of the third session, I do a halfway assessment to find out how the last three sessions have been. Okay. If the style that I work, the way I work, are they okay with that? Is there anything different they'd like to do? So every therapist has their own style and that has to be adapted to every client differently. Of course. Okay? So uh, I have a background I volunteer with an agency that supports victims of domestic violence and abuse. Oh. So in a space like that, yes, you do counseling, but it's more directive because you're working with a lot of risk and safeguarding there. Yeah. You know, I don't even know if I'll see my client the next week if they're still staying with the perpetrator, right? So I have to mm -hmm. be more directive in terms of challenging them gently and politely. So there are times that I do tend to be directive in my sessions based on the presenting issues. I do put it out there, like, look, we've had seven sessions. It doesn't look like we are achieving anything because, you know, you can fill up 50 minutes talking about the weather. Trust me, it can start with the weather and it can end with the weather or beach mein matlab, you've not done any work. So... So I do give the option to the client saying, what is it that you want to really achieve? So mm -hmm. if you've not had much of an outcome in the first six sessions, then I, I tend to put together a few questions for them based on their presenting issues as what is it that they would like to achieve? So somebody says, oh, I want to change my behavior. What does change look like? And how can I help you achieve that? And again, having said all this, I always stress on the fact that therapy is a collaborative process. You and I work together, we walk together. So I do as much hard work as you should be doing. So I will not be able to do the hard work for you. Yeah. <clears throat> True. Yeah. So. Uh, sorry. No, no, go on. Do you take your work home if there are pressing cases or so finally you are a human being, you can't be listening and saying, okay, I don't care. Uh, is there a sense of grappling with issues at times, which may not be your own, but because you need to be understanding them better? Not necessarily offering a solution, but like sometimes we uh, 
as normal human beings, if you tell me something that is happening to you and as a friend or as a colleague or as a person known to you, I listen to that and I wonder what would I do in your place? Mm. And I realize the impact of the entire situation. Obviously, they've come for tackling a mental issue that itself says something. Mm. Uh, mm. So how do you, uh, what is your work pattern or do you just uh, leave your cases once you leave office uh, because that discipline is also necessary for your own mental health oh absolutely and you you get that discipline only after messing about for the first few months <laughs> okay i that i went honest <laughs> yes oh absolutely bunty i went all out when i got qualified last year in october I, I was full of hopes and trepidation, if I may say that. Uh, I was filling every slot available for the first six months of this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it caught up with me because mm -hmm. I'm still doing my day job. Um, so I had a little break in between in July over the summertime and I was just reflecting about how I would like to do things differently. Um, and that's been really helpful. So what I do is, I mean, I work from home. So this is my therapy room as well. Uh, <clears throat> and I also offer online counseling as well. I don't take any counseling clients between Mondays and Wednesdays. I just stick to my day job. I don't do anything outside of that. I ensure mm -hmm. I have enough downtime. I do things that I like, which is mostly reading, as you can tell. Um, uh, I take a lot of time off the screen. Okay. So that's, I think, one of the things that's also encouraged is to have self-care. Now I know self-care is an overused word these days. But for me, self-care is probably having a line on a Sunday morning and not waking up before nine o'clock. That's that's where I am with, with self-care, right? Yes. It's nice to throw in the chocolate cake, but it will find its way somewhere else. So sleeping is 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 much better so so yeah i make sure that i don't overbook my appointments i don't uh, take on too much i'm more happy to say no i'd rather let go of that one extra client rather than filling in my day um i don't do back to back sessions either so most of the sessions are 50 minutes rather all the sessions are 50 minutes but there are clients who sometimes ask for an hour and a half I very reluctantly offer it to them uh, because it does take a toll on them as well as on me. So I very rarely offer one and a half sessions. Um, yeah, so I think I've been, I'm, I've perhaps been able to balance things in a way which, uh, which doesn't rock the boat, if that makes sense. It's very tempting to have that extra client and build in your hours. But I think I'm also very privileged in the sense that I have my day job that pays the bills. And this is something which is like my second job. I'm equally committed to this, uh, but this has far reaching impact on my mental health. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, I make sure that like, like out here in the UK, the school systems, they have a half term break every two, two and a half months. Uh, like end of October, there's a one week break. I make sure I take no clients in that one week. Yeah. 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 So no, I, and if I do grapple with things, I always take it to supervision. I address it. I do a lot of reflection. I do a lot of journaling. I read a lot. I try to keep myself abreast about what's happening. I have a very good support systems of ex-colleagues and peers. We meet once a month. We have informal group discussion as well. Um, yeah, so I'm lucky to have that support in several ways. Uh, it is quite interesting to see the view from inside where one actually thinks of uh, people sitting on the other side of the table mm -hmm. as know-it-alls, but they seem to have all the answers. They have their uh, shit together as we say um, 
and uh, very rarely does one get an opportunity to uh, look at the vulnerable part of it like you've been sharing uh, it's such a beautiful space uh, considering that the values that you've covered by uh, not even mentioning them but i would just want to bring them up because uh, you are ensuring that the humility is professional humility that you sit down and work with other people find out how to do things properly uh, uh, yeah, there is obviously self awareness and kindness towards your own self where you are trying to take breaks and not get overwhelmed by the kind of job that you are doing uh, for me this has been a learning experience this chat because most of the time there is very easy classification that happens, uh, especially when it comes to anything to do with counseling in various yeah. forms. These days, uh, I find that every second Insta ad is about, okay, you can talk about yeah. this. And I find it very disturbing. That means effectively our other social systems are breaking down that people have to resort to such things. Not that I'm judgmental about what works for uh, others. Uh, I think ensuring effective mental health is more important than how one does it. If it means talking to a professional, I think it's perfectly all right. Uh, I'm glad that we had this chat. I also want to thank you on behalf of a lot of friends that I speak to and I find them very disturbed uh, mm. due to I, I see words, my daughter is a teen and she, one day she said our generation use bandies about words like anxiety and depression and stress far too casually. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would, is, I, would, I would throw in gaslighting as well. Half of them don't know what that means, but it's used uh, very often. It's like you have 11-year-olds saying, oh, oh, I'm getting anxiety. What do you even know what that means, right? So... Yeah. I think it's really a reflection of the society that we are in, Bunty. Yeah. Um, also, right, I mean, going back to one of the things that we discussed about, uh, you didn't say the word power balance, imbalance, but you spoke about being arrogant or something. Uh, yeah. Or how do you not be arrogant or yeah. something to or those proud lines. proud of the fact that you help people. Proud, so yeah. So one of the things, right, if a client is presenting me something which I'm not aware of, I just tell them, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't sit there smugly with a nod as if I bloody understood everything. Far from it. So I work with uh, with quite a few clients who are in the 22 to 24, 25 age group. Yeah. And uh, they all date using apps. I don't know what that means. And I've struggled with that for the longest time. People would come and say, oh, I met them on Hinge or Tinder or Facebook. I don't know if Facebook is for dating, but I'm just throwing yeah. it there, right? Uh, so one of these young boys, young men that I work with, he's about 25 year old. He actually sat down next to me. He got his mobile out and he said, uh, Sujata, this is what a dating app looks like. He said, this, if I do left, I don't know what left or right means, oh, but he said, uh, you you swap left and right. And then he was very kind enough to show me his Educated. profile. He said, okay, this is a person that I met. And some of them have been presented in my issues. So I, it was kind of a bit weird to put a face to face to those people. But I, I kind of learned that this is how dating happens. And I'm a I'm little bit informed. If somebody says I swipe left and right, I'm sitting there now with a knowing look rather than a confusing mm. look. So I think uh, it's also letting your clients know that you have you don't have all the answers. There are areas that you don't know what that means like. And it's absolutely fine. And I think most often than not, clients appreciate that honesty. Uh. Mm. Uh, you know, like, uh, I think one of the other things for us, again, because this is regulated the way it is in the UK, is about disclosures. Uh, it's, again, related to maintaining boundaries. But if a disclosure is relational to what the client is talking, it, 
it's all right. Say, for example, if I have a client who's who's presenting an issue about her teenage daughter, you know. Now, I'm a mother of a 16-year-old, so I know what that means. So I may perhaps be able to relate to that situation with a lived experience and even share my experience with my child without getting into details. Yeah, of course. Does that make sense? Obviously. Yeah. So it's 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 done in a relational way. I'm not I'm not telling the client that look, I have a 16 year old who's this and that. I'm just kind of concurring to her experience and kind of letting her know. Look, I know what that means because I also have a teen at home. Yeah. So yeah, uh, to go back to what I was trying to say there was. Wow. Thank you. I didn't realize it was an hour since we were talking. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you for uh, this chat. I am hoping, uh, like all your other endeavors and what I have been trying to do with the Values Workshop, it helps people understand themselves better, understand your profession better, and uh, may kindness take over the world. Thank oh, absolutely. So. I think that's the only thing that's needed, Bhanti. Matlab, everything else will find a way around. If there is kindness, uh, I think it's it's nice. It's 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 cool like they say, right? Yes. I'll see you around. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Panti. Thank you so much. Bye. Good luck. Bye.